All right. Thank you very much for the organizers for um, uh, having this uh, webinar. Um, as uh, was said earlier, my name is Nicholas Afraniev, and I'll be talking uh, about Napari, a multi-dimensional image viewer for Python. Um, I also wanted to um, say thank you to all of you for, for coming today. I know it's a, it's a hard time in the world right now for a lot of people, and um, particularly wanted to extend a welcome and message of, of support to anyone from the Black image analysis community in the US that has joined us today. So with that, um, I want to give you a little bit of an outline for today. Um, so I'm going to spend uh, about uh, 20 minutes um, on uh, welcome and uh, introductory slides. Um, then we'll have about sort of 10 minutes as we transition um, to uh, about installing um, Napari and um, today's lessons. Um, then we've got three lessons um, that are going to be taught out of um, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, the first one on um, uh, image visualization, uh, the second one on manual annotation, and the third one on um, interactive uh, analysis. And then we'll have uh, a wrap up and uh, a conclusion. And um, as was mentioned earlier, I want to um, thank that we're being joined today by today's moderators, uh, Kevin uh, and Tally, who are uh, core developers uh, on Napari as well, and Rocco, who's one of the organizers um, of this event. So, I think uh, this audience will be well familiar that um, over the past um, you know, 10 years, there's, there's been an incredible in, in improvement and increase in what we are capable of um, measuring um, with microscopes. And so you know, this example of uh, a developing mouse embryo from the, the Color Lab is a, is a light sheet recording that um, you know, can be um, you know, tens of, of terabytes or you know, 10 terabytes of data, I think, can, can come out of an experiment like this. Um, and uh, you know, there's so much richness that um, someone wants to uh, extract here, the position and location of all the cells. Um, you know, these are real um, analysis challenges, visualization challenges. Um, and you know, thinking um, more generally about um, you know, what, what do biologists really need to do with images? Okay, you know, visualize, annotate, um, extract results uh, in workflows. And um, you know, there's a, a lot of, um, amazing uh, methods for this, but I think a, a lot of this is um, is really quite challenging. And, um, you know, there is a sort of um, you know, heterogeneity of um, uh, quite incredible existing um, uh, image analysis tools um, that, that are already out there and that, um, you know, people are finding a lot of value from, um, uh, you know, Fiji uh, cell profile, uh, uh, really very you know, important tools like that. Something that's happened in the past um, five years, though, that um, I think is, is also very important to know, is that there's been an incredible rise of um, a kind of computer vision, machine learning techniques, things like um, you know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, that you know, really um, enable um, advanced uh, segmentation, tracking algorithms. Um, uh, but I think a lot of biologists still uh, lack access to, um, uh, you know, advanced algorithms like this. And um, that, you know, maybe if you, you go to a computer vision conference sometimes and it, it looks like things are sort of solved, but um, there's still uh, definitely a problem um, disseminating these sorts of methods. And so the, the team, um, the Napari team um, sort of uh, got together um, maybe you know, two years ago to start working on um, a kind of fast, interactive, multi-dimensional image viewer for Python. And um, the reason why um, it was sort of for, for Python, I think for a lot of us is we, we was sort of switched our analysis um, uh, methods over to, to Python to kind of try and leverage uh, a lot of those, say, advanced machine learning algorithms or just uh, other um, sort of virtues of the, the scientific Python stack. And so Napari, as I sort of said, is it's designed for browsing, annotating, and analyzing large multidimensional images. Um, it's built on top of uh, Qt um, as, a, as a GUI framework. Um, uh, it leverages uh, a Python library, uh, VizPy, for performant GPU uh, rendering. And um, you know, some of its key features really are that um, it enables a uh, fast visualization and uh, interactivity, and then uh, three-dimensional rendering um, and ND slicing. So it's got a sort of full n-dimensional data model. If you have time, channels, um, arbitrary number of, uh, of channels like that, um, and uh, it's designed to sort of scale 
to large data sets. So it's not constrained by what fits um, on RAM or even what fits on your computer. It can pull uh, data from remote data sources as well. Um, it supports a variety of uh, fundamental data types um, that um, we can leverage as layers. And I'll say a little bit more about those um, in a moment. And um, you know, by virtue of, of being in, in Python, it's, it's very easy to integrate it with um, advanced uh, machine learning methods, deep learning methods. Um, and uh, it's also sort of customizable and extendable. Um, we have um, the ability to add custom uh, key bindings, um, mouse functions, and um, we're designing a plugin interface uh, as well now. So um, let me tell you a little bit about um, the Napari viewer. Um, you can see it um, has uh, a couple of features, like there is a um, uh, less specific controls in the um, top left-hand corner. Um, these are sort of um, GUI elements that allow you to control uh, the properties of particular images that you're looking at. Um, we have a layer list um, uh, below that that um, uh, contains um, a, a little a representation of all the layers that you've added into Napari so far. Um, these layers, as I said before, can, they can be of different types. So we have um, image types, um, uh, points if you just want to mark particular locations, uh, labels if you want to do um, segmentation and uh, annotate particular um, uh, regions in a pixel-wise uh, capacity, um, shapes for drawing uh, polygons, um, uh, vectors, and um, and so um, we also uh, have um, the support for uh, multiple dimensions, as I mentioned earlier. So um, depending on how many additional dimensions your data has, you get um, additional dimension sliders that are indicated at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's a canvas, um, which is where the image gets rendered. And uh, we also have an integrated um, console um, that uh, allows you to interact uh, via um, uh, or with Python um, with all the Napari objects. So that's, um, that's uh, the, um, the Napari viewer. Um, let me tell you a tiny bit about um, the Napari team. So um, we have a steering council of uh, three people, um, myself, um, Lua Croye, uh, investigator at the Chen Zuckerberg Biohub, and, and Juan Nunez Iglesias, um, um, an, an investigator at Monash University. And uh, we have um, a number of uh, core developers, uh, including Tally Lambert and Kevin, who are on the, on the call helping um, answer questions today, and who, who've really done an incredible job um, driving this uh, project forward. Um, and we also have been lucky enough to receive um, uh, contributions from a, a large number of people. And, and we're really open to contributions as well. And so, you know, I should say all this development is being done um, on GitHub um, in the open. Everything's open source. And, um, you know, we really welcome um, contributors uh, from newcomers through to experts. And so, um, with that, I'm actually going to um, switch to um, a little bit of uh, some live demos um, and um, you know, talk a little bit about uh, the viewer um, before we dive into the lessons um, uh, later uh, in the course. But are, are there any um, in, important questions, uh, Tali, have come up at this moment? Okay. So let me switch over to some um, examples. Um, all right, let me find the one I want to start with. Okay, so I'm going to start with this one. And um, so this is, um, I've loaded here a pathology image um, into Napari. And this is a whole slide image. So it's um, a few, it's about 100,000 by 200,000 pixels. And um, I can seamlessly uh, load in and out and zoom in and out. So it's sort of, you know, Google Maps style um, uh, rendering and, you know, with, with uh, image pyramids and tiling and, um, uh, you know, Napari will um, dynamically fetch uh, the just the amount of the image that you want to look at at each moment in time. So we don't have to sort of load this whole thing into memory in one go. We can just pull in um, exactly what um, what you need. And um, then um, around here, I've also got um, some annotations. So here um, I've got um, some, uh, tumors that had been previously um, uh, annotated by a pathologist and that I loaded in. Um, I can actually um, create more annotations. Maybe I'm going to zoom in here. I'm actually going to now um, create a new layer, um, a new points layer. Maybe I'm going to call this um, 
uh, cells. And then I can come in here and um, in the points layer, I have you know, various different uh, tools. Um, you know, this tool is going to allow me to add uh, little points um, around um, the location of each of the cells that, I, that I'm interested in. And um, what's nice is that I can then open up the Napari console and um, I can then programmatically um, just grab access to that, that layer um, and then just grab uh, access to those points. And then if I add some more and I run this again, I have more points. And so, uh, and similarly, as we'll see in the lessons uh, with the Jupyter Notebook, this is, you know, these sorts of interactions are also possible from a Jupyter Notebook. And uh, if I were to edit this data here, that would actually then update what I was uh, seeing on the screen. Um, so that's an example of um, the points layer and um, some manual interactivity. Um, I can also um, do use, uh, create a new shapes layer. Um, here, maybe I'll sort of zoom out. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm interested in uh, just, you know, uh, drawing um, a rectangle around um, this particular um, area. And then I can also go into the console and extract those parameters. Um, and so in this way, I can both, uh, you know, visualize uh, in a kind of lazy fashion, um, very, very large data sets um, and, um, and annotate them. Um, you show another example here. So this is um, one channel of kind of a volumetric time series from um, a lattice light sheet um, data set. And um, again, this is, I think, you know, tens of gigabytes, um, but um, I'm kind of just dynamically loading um, as I move the slider, each particular um, uh, you know, chunk of data that I need to visualize what's on the screen. And so that makes it very, very fast and um, very performance. Um, on disk, this file is being stored actually as a ZAR file, um, but um, there are similar ways to do this um, if you have a directory of TIFFs as well, um, and you can dynamically load um, each one too. Um, over here, um, these are some of the other um, sort of controls that are relevant to uh, images. So I can adjust contrast limits. Um, I can sort of really go in and, and do that um, yeah, in detail. I can adjust different um, color maps um, as well. And, um, so those are um, sort of two examples of um, uh, interactivity and visualization. Um, but um, I think one of the things that's, that's very exciting about Napari is the uh, potential to couple to um, analysis and, um, and customization. And, and so um, while Napari itself is really um, right now uh, just a core viewer with these different layer types, um, again, because it is um, Python based, it's quite easy to um, uh, connect in to um, you know really incredible um, uh, analysis routines, and so in this little example, I've actually got done two things. Um, one is I've kind of added here this sort of custom um, uh, GUI element, and we'll talk a little bit in the final lesson about what it is um, means to add custom GUI elements. Um, and I've also hooked up to some analysis in the background, and so here. Um, you know, these are images coming from a um, high throughput screen done by recursion pharmaceuticals um, of um, cells infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and uh, I can sort of navigate around um, here and look at different examples uh, from the screen. And um, each um, time I, I've sort of changed field of view, it's, it's dynamically loaded um, the data. And so and it's a five color channel data. You can see it's quite nice. Um, I can look at each color channel independently. I can adjust uh, contrast limits of, of each one. I can turn um, uh, them on and off uh, separately. Um, and um, what I can also do, let me make nuclei right, right. You can see the nuclei. Um, all right, so as I was saying though before that one of, one of the uh, exciting things is, is uh, connecting to analysis and kind of um, executing that analysis um, on command. And so I've rigged up uh, a button here in, in the background that is going to call out to the Stardust um, uh, segmentation algorithm. It's a very exciting Python um, TensorFlow based um, uh, segmentation algorithm and apply it to the current field of view that I'm looking at, the nuclear channel. And so this applied to the nuclear channel, you can see it's uh, really done an incredible um, job. That's all the credit to the, um, the Stardust developers. Um, 
But uh, what's nice is if I now, you know, just sort of change field of view, okay, I look at another one, I'm like, okay, how does Stardust do on this one? Um, let's just sort of see, oh, okay, it seems to do quite nicely. Um, and okay, this, wow, these cells look really very different than um, the previous cells. I can just sort of see, okay, how does my algorithm do? Um, I can run it and okay, there it is. And so it's kind of nice because like, I, I didn't have to sort of like run, you know, there are, I think, 10,000 images in this um, data set easily. Um, and I didn't have to sort of run the algorithm on every single one. I could kind of interactively browse, see what I wanted to see, then check the algorithm, um, kind of do spot checks, um, things like that. And so I think um, this kind of you know, analysis, visualization, interactivity, um, all being done together is I, I think a really powerful combination. Um, another example, uh, so will be my uh, final example um, is, um, um, here, where I'm now going to um, I'm now going to do a uh, pixel-wise annotation. Um, I'm going to use um, uh, a paintbrush to label some cells as um, uh, into different classes. So if, if people are familiar with the um, Elastic tool, this is sort of um, a demo that's inspired by that tool. Um, so I'm kind of labeling here some um, uh, background, some uh, nuclei. Um, do a little bit of this guy, and then I'm going to label some um, uh, cytoplasm too. And um, again, you know, the point of this example is is really let me see how this does. If I execute, try and get it to run on the rest of the field. Okay, and boom, and sort of um, generalize that sort of uh, pretty well. Uh, I can maybe see here. Okay, this looks like something a little uh, funny. Maybe if I um, uh, come back and um, uh, touch this up as, as being um, actually background if I run it again. Um, okay, so it's sort of improved a little bit. And um, here in this labels layer, I have different options like um, paint brushes, fill buckets, erasers, uh, color pickers, um, you know, a lot of the functionality that, that you might expect from uh, a, a graphics um, editing tool, but it really now kind of customized for the scientific use case. And um, you know, the, the way this, this particular example has worked is there was a, um, a pre-trained uh, featureizer based on a unit. Um, and then there was a, a random forest algorithm, rather like Elastic, um, that was uh, running on top for the pixel-wise segmentation. Um, but I, I really mean it uh, to show it uh, more sort of illustrative of, um, you know, what does kind of interactive uh, analysis with a tool like Napari look like. Okay, so those were... Um, the demos, I just had some gifts of them. Actually, this is a really great GIF as well um, that Tally made, which is um, it's really incredible. So this is um, some lattice light sheet data that um, I think he had, uh, had collected. And um, what's happening here is every time the slider gets moved, the data gets loaded from disk, uh, from a TIFF, I think, and then it gets um, uh, de-skewed because the data often with lattice light sheet can be kind of collected at a, at a skew, de-skewed and deconvolved and then uh, render. And um, what's so exciting about that is that now, instead of having to store two copies of the data, like a raw copy and then a deconvolved, de-skewed copy, um, you know, we can just store one copy, but then we can visualize the, um, you know, the data exactly as we want to see it. And um, you know, in many cases, actually, when you do that processing, the data volume goes up as well. It's, it's, it's less uh, space efficient to store the, um, the de-skewed, deconvolved uh, data. And so, you know, there, there are many advantages towards this sort of lazy computation approach um, where you're, you're, you're combining visualization and computation um, uh, in, in one. So um, those are um, some examples. Uh, you know, we're really excited to see people out in the community building on top of uh, Napari. It's been great to see, um, you know, some people tweeting out examples of, uh, of using the tool. We, we really um, love to see that and want to make that possible and want to hear from um, all of you, um, uh, particularly if you're running into problems. Um, you know, what's next for Napara? We've got a couple of uh, features planned. Uh, one is uh, around uh, making a standalone app. As I mentioned at the very beginning, um, you know, I think a, a big goal of this tool is to become um, accessible to um, uh, research biologists that that maybe don't know how to do Python coding or use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, you know, this session today will use Jupyter Notebooks as maybe a little bit more at the sort of intermediate level, um, advanced level, but we really want this tool to be then accessible to people that, that don't have those skills as well. 
Um, we're also going to be working on script and macro generation so that if you did a series of steps in the viewer and um, you wanted to then record those as a script that you could um, replay potentially like in a headless mode, maybe you sort of annotated your first 10 images and now want to run that analysis on the, the remaining 1000. Um, and then we're also thinking about multiple link canvases, let's say if you want like ortho views, um, improving um, our performance with remote data. Um, adding infrastructure for analysis plugins. Uh, we've uh, currently support some infrastructure for file IO plugins um, so that people can um, read and write. Um, and um, yeah, so um, for more info, um, you can visit uh, napari.org. It's our website. Um, and um, you also uh, can access um, uh, or reach out to us uh, on the forum for um, help um, and um, on um, uh, GitHub. Uh, so we were on the ImageSC forum, as I, as I just said, um, and um, on um, uh, GitHub as well. And um, we, our Twitter handle is Napari Imaging. So that was sort of um, it for the slides. Maybe now is a, a good time to, again, sort of pause and ask, um, if there are any uh, questions from um, uh, the moderators that, that need uh, answering? I would say the main thing coming in is just uh, support for various file formats. Does does Napari support this? Does Napari support that? So I, you just sort of said it, but maybe clarify that. Yeah, that's a, thanks Sally. Okay, so um, as was just mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of the things actually that characterizes um, the um, image analysis space is, is, is the heterogeneity of, uh, of file formats. And, and um, Napari, right now, we have um, uh, actually done some work to make a um, a plugin interface where um, uh, you can write your own um, uh, kind of file loader if, if you want. We have a number of um, a sort of a support for built-in, uh, kind of built-in support for um, the sort of standard, um, let's say non-proprietary format. So, you know, TIFFs, JPEGs, PNGs, things like that. Um, and then for some of the more uh, vendor specific formats, um, where um, people have been working on plugins for those. Um, you know, I'd say right now, actually, uh, you know, an, an incredible one has come from uh, the Allen Cell Institute, um, the AI um, and for reading um, CZI, um, Zeiss files. Um, and um, I'd say right now we're in a place where things that you can read into Python. So if there is exists a, a way to sort of get it into Python, then um, it's pretty easy to turn that into a, a, an Apari plugin. And uh, maybe that's something that um, we'll provide uh, links to um, when we post uh, answers to these questions in the forum as well. Okay, so with that, um, I wanted to now transition to um, installing the Pari in today's lessons. Um, so um, as was said, um, you know, I'm going to be teaching today using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which I think were introduced uh, really nicely to this uh, community um, by uh, Guillaume um, uh, Wits in uh, one of his um, New Bias presentations a few weeks ago. Um, and um, the training material is accessible on um, this repository. Um, it's, uh, you can get it with the new bias slash Napari slash 2020 at the bit.ly link, um, uh, but it's also um, Sophronia and my, my, my GitHub handle, Napari training course. Um, and so um, here are, there are some installation and setup instructions that uh, hopefully people have received um, uh, before the, um, the presentation. I think if this is sort of looking very um, uh, new and um, uh, in, in intimidating, then um, you're welcome to uh, follow along. Um, we actually have um, uh, a um, kind of pre-built way to um, uh, interactively follow along uh, using Binder uh, as well, which is uh, a way to do um, a remote um, uh, notebooks as well. So. Um, I was not planning to go through the instructions now, but um, if there are, uh, if the moderators do, do want to flag anything um, urgent, I can um, I can do that um, as well. Um, so, so sorry, Nick. There is um, somebody reporting that the link for binder zip folder mm -hmm. uh, is not working, and so um, Tali addressed people to the right button there. 
So if you can remind how to run in, um, in binder. Should I open it up? Should I see if the binder works? Yeah. Okay, so I click the binder. Um, we'll see, if, I'll let it spin in the background. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I, I, we, we're doing great. We're doing well on time. So I'll spend a couple of minutes um, here. So, um, you know, to get going with this notebook, if you want to get going locally, you can clone this repository um, or you can um, uh, download it um, as a zip. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the zip download, you can also get from, I think it's, um, over and over. Um, clone or download here. Yeah. So you can also do download as a zip right here. Um, so that's that's where you can download. And then once you um, unzip, um, uh, you can navigate into the main directory. And then um, you can, uh, the recommended approach is to create a condo environment um, using an environment YAML uh, that we provide. So you can run this command and then activate it um, with Safari. Um, or if you you know are um, comfortable with um, uh, all these tools and um, and you know used to managing your own environments, you can pip install the Pari and Sitekit image um, to file uh, or our, our requirements. Um, and uh, we're also using a tool Magic GUI that, uh, that um, for one of the uh, examples. And then um, if this is all working, you should actually be able to just type Napari into the terminal. Um, and it should launch an empty Napari window. Uh, you could also um, run uh, Python check setup.py and see um, an image from Cell Nuclear. Let's see the binder. Okay, so the binder has run. So if you've launched the binder like this, it's really important to um, uh, first activate your desktop. So you can see here, I turn on desktop. Uh, and so what's happening here is that um, Napari need Napari is basically like a is a, like a local application um, more primarily than a web-based application, and so it needs a desktop to run in. And so here we have a virtual desktop, and we're using um, a, a sort of um, no VNC to um, access it. And so this is run. Um, I will I will show how to get going here, but before I switch over to um, um, my local copy, um, but just to kind of get people going who uh, want to get going with the notebooks on Binder. Uh, you can see now I navigated into the notebook. Um, and um, again, there's actually this, this special command that um, you have to run if you're using the notebook with Binder um, to connect it up. And um, it's important to, re to remember to wait a little bit until after you've run this command um, for this uh, computer to um, be ready. Um, and um, once it's uh, it's run, um, I'm just gonna just gonna run these first two just to kind of ch check that um, it's working for people. Um, let's see. So if I run this one, okay. So I have Napari over here. Okay. So that means the binder link should be working. Um, so if people run into more um, uh, problems um, with uh, with binder, um, we can uh, we can come back to that. I'm gonna kind of switch back to my um, local copy of this. Um, and um, uh, sort of go from here. So, as I said um, um, earlier, you know, as you've sort of seen the Pari, um, it's a tool that we can use for uh, visualization um, and um, supports a, a wide variety of um, uh, layer types and, and interaction patterns. And so, if you're following along now with this um, uh, notebook locally, um, the first uh, thing I want, I want to call out is that Napari, we use uh, Qt for our, our graphical uh, user interface. And so um, when using um, Napari with a Jupyter Notebook or an interactive IPython session, you have to first create uh, the Qt application. And so that is done using this percent GUI Qt command. And so I will just sort of do that uh, now. Um, if you are um, running uh, this inside a, a script, so a Python script, not inside a notebook, and then you can create the Qt application inside a, a context um, using with Napari GUI Qt. But we won't be doing that today. We'll be using today the, the notebooks. Um, and so now that that's been created, I can import Napari and um, I can create a, a viewer, which is our sort of you know um, kind of basic object. And um, so if I run this now, um, you can see that a, a viewer has popped up on my screen. Um, it's empty. Um, it's, I'm going to make it, make it kind of full screen. Um, 
It is, um, you know, unlike tools like IPy Volume or uh, Jupyter Widgets, um, it's not embedded inside the Jupyter Notebook. Um, it is a separate um, uh, a screen. Um, you know, the advantage of that is that it allows us to use um, sort of native rendering um, technologies, sort of web-based rendering technologies, which, which when you are local uh, are more performant. Um, and that's kind of why we had to have um, this um, uh, bind, um, this sort of second uh, window in the binder context, um, because it had, there had to be a desktop somewhere. Um, so if I come back um, here, um, I can also, uh, something that's um, helpful for sort of teaching, um, but um, you know, maybe less uh, critical um, when you're um, just using the notebook, uh, using um, Napari for your own uh, work, is that we do have a sort of notebook screenshot functionality so that if you want to uh, capture a screenshot of what you happen to be looking at in the notebook at any moment in time, uh, or looking at Napari in any moment in time, um, it will appear, um, yeah, one second. Um, and, uh, and, um, here the Napari viewer is, uh, is empty. There's nothing here. So the screenshot just has the, the empty viewer and unlike the real Napari, the screenshot is, is not interactive. So it's just, a, it's just a... okay. So there are, um, a, a couple of different ways to, uh, load images into the viewer. So, um, you know, one really simple way is um, dragging and dropping um, files. Uh, so you can just, um, you know, from the, from the finder, um, drag and drop uh, files onto the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, you can also um, uh, select files from our open file menu. So, you know, up here, we have an, a, a bunch of open uh, options. Um, and then um, there is the viewer um, uh, dot open command, uh, where you, you give uh, a file path, um, which we can use from the notebook. Or the one that we'll look at uh, first is that we can actually load the image data um, into Python using um, sort of standard Python um, uh, loading functions and then um, pass that um, uh, array using the viewer.addImage command. And so there's really like a, a sort of a range of sort of expertise and sort of sophistication with, um, with Python that um, uh, uh, on display here. So, you know, the, the drag and drop is the most accessible and, and now this viewer.add command is maybe the most flexible. Um, and um, for these first three options, the uh, file um, will actually, the path will actually pass through our plugin interface. And so um, depending on what plugins you have available, um, you can maybe, you know, support a wide variety of file types. Um, and so again, here in this final one, it's really anything that you load into Python, um, you could potentially view in Napari now. And so I'm gonna use the very nice uh, TIFF file uh, reader to read uh, a TIFF file, data nuclei. And, um, you know, this um, uh, file was um, uh, installed when you installed the repository and uh, is at the uh, data um, location um, inside the lessons. And so hopefully if people run this now, they're able to um, load in the data and see that, um, okay, we've got three dimensional data. It's, a, it's an array that has a shape that is 60 by 256 by 256. And uh, now let's, uh, let's try adding it to the viewer. And so I'm gonna add with this, just with this command. And if I come back to my viewer in the other screen, okay, it doesn't look like much has happened, but actually now we've got this slider here and I can slide through and, um, you know, this is 60 steps. So this is the um, uh, full 60. And um, I can now sort of zoom in, uh, zoom out, move around. I can kind of reset where I was looking at. Um, I'm actually just going to do this in the binder as well, just to kind of um, see that it happens. So can we come back to um, from the binder before? Just maybe run that to the screenshot. Okay, I'm going to load the TIFF file again, and then I'm going to add here. And now the I've added it, and it's in um, this window here. And you can see now that this is a lot slower. Um, that's because it's sort of going through the no VNC. But you know, I think this can again be good to give a sense of um, uh, you know if you just want to. to to easily and quickly um, explore using the Pari, it can be a good um, uh, a, a good method. Okay, so I'm going to go back to um, uh, teaching now, just using um, my local notebooks. Um, but um, if you are following along with the binder, um, hopefully that's that's working for you too. 
So let's see. So sorry, by now, take sorry Nicholas, to stop yeah. you. So somebody in the audience asked if you can please go slightly slower while you show the different cell execution in Jupiter, so yeah. they can follow. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the um, let me maybe even recap. So the really important ones um, are that I've loaded in um, this um, this data. And then I've used the Napari, the viewer add image command. And so add image is um, our uh, uh, sort of, you know, most flexible way of adding um, um, data that's already been loaded into Python into, um, into Napari. And um, then I've taken a, a screenshot. And you can see that a couple of cool things have happened here, if I just even focus on the screenshot, the non-interactive thing, um, is created this layer that's actually called nuclei. And it's done that by um, uh, looking at the, the name of the variable here and uh, understanding <clears throat> what that name was and that it should, um, that this layer should have that same name there. Um, so if you see in the, let me go back to, um, <clears throat> um, go back here. So there are a number of uh, different uh, control panels that, that we saw um, earlier. And so, uh, you know, everyone should um, maybe you know, spend a, a, a tiny bit of time um, playing around with them. Um, you know, these are nuclei, so maybe we want to make them blue. Um, we have contrast lines. If I right click uh, on this slider, I actually get this expanded view here, which I can type into. Um, and so I can, um, get finer control over um, what I'm looking at there. I can type in contrast limits. Um, I can adjust opacity, which you know, right now with, with only one image uh, present is um, less exciting. Um, so let me go back to the viewer, so or notebooks. OK, so color channels and blending. Um, so as I said, uh, you know, right clicking on um, the contrast limit slider uh, brought up that uh, elongated version of the slider, uh, which I could type specific numbers into. And um, then I was able to adjust contrast limits um, and sort of change the color maps to, uh, to blue. Um, and um, in general, I uh, use any of those drop down uh, menus. Um, and so again, I can sort of take that screenshot you know, I think for the people following um, uh, along in the audience, you know, this, the screenshot functionality is, is, is less critical now because you have the actual viewer there. Um, but it is something that you can use if you want to, say, create a frozen version of this notebook to share with someone else who, you know, isn't going to install the tool. Um, so I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, um, you know, we have this concept of layers that get added to the viewer and um, I can um, execute this code cell, which is going to um, look at what layers are inside the viewer. So I can um, run this print viewer dot layers. And uh, right now we've only got um, one layer, which is this nuclei layers and it's an image it's type image layer. Um, and as I said, it, you know, it, it, Napari figured out that we should name this layer nuclei because that was the um, name of the variable that we loaded in um, um, from this, which was pretty cool. So um, we can then go in and we can um, um, get that nuclei led by uh, referencing it with um, uh, its string name. And then we can um, look at some of its properties that, that we can control um, from the GUI too. So if I just run this where I'm going to print the color map, uh, I'm going to see that the color map is blue and, and then that, that's an object corresponding to it. I'm going to see that the contrast limits um, are that 0 0.07, 0 0.035, those things that I just um, edited uh, in the GUI. And uh, the opacity is, is kind of still at one. And so as I mentioned um, earlier, what's, what's really nice about um, uh, Napari as well is that you have this kind of bi-directional communication um, with the Jupyter Notebook and the viewer. So, you know, before we just saw how if I change things in the viewer, then um, they update in, uh, in the notebook. And so now let's sort of go the other direction. So now let's change some properties in um, uh, the notebook and let's see how they update in the viewer. So I'm going to change the color map to be red. I'm going to change the contrast limits uh, to be a, a tighter range. 
I'm going to reduce the opacity just to see. I'm actually also going to rename the layer as well. I'm going to, I'm going to call this a sort of division. Um, so if I run this, if I come back now in my other um, window to Napari, you can see that the color map is now red. Uh, the contrast limits are now smaller and the opacity has changed. And so um, it really is that, that, that ability to kind of go back and forth. Um, and um, uh, you know, again, all of this is happening right now in, uh, across all our slices. So you can, you can look um, across slices. Um, if I take a screenshot, just to capture the screenshot, um, you can see that it's now, it's now red too. Um, so actually stepping back, um, you know, we could have actually passed these parameters as keyword arguments um, during the first add image call. Um, and so let's actually now kind of just do this again. Let's add a new copy of um, these nuclei um, with that, those nice kind of 0 0.7, 0 0.35 blue numbers that we found before. And um, let's actually also set the blending mode to be additive so that these uh, color channels uh, blend together. So let's see if we run this now. I run um, the add image command. Um, and if I go over to the viewer, you can see now that I've got um, you know, both images here and they're blended together. And so uh, I've got this. Um, doesn't actually. Um, and here, you know, if I'd had a, a translucent, then I wouldn't have seen the other one. So again, these are sort of different types of, uh, of blending. Um, and again, all this is sort of happening in, um, in three dimensions. So um, let me take a screenshot just to capture it. So here, this is sort of just, you know, two views of the same data. Um, let's make it maybe a little bit more exciting. So we're going to go and we're going to use uh, the imread from tiffile again. And um, now we're going to load in um, uh, more image data and look at its shape. These are going to be some membranes. Um, so let's see. OK, oh, it's the same shape as before. So if we remember the nuclei, they were 60 by 256 by 256. This is also the same. And um, now I'm going to uh, add these to the viewer as well. I'm going to add this image to the viewer as well. Also with a, a additive blending mode, I'm going to set some contrast limits. Um, I'm not going to set the name. The name will get automatically inferred from this variable, but I will set the color map to be green. And so if I run here, maybe now let's come back to the viewer. Um, you can see now that uh, I've got the membranes. And, and again, it's sort of all blended together, which is really you know, quite nice. Um, and uh, I can take a, a screenshot of that too. So now we've seen how to add um, uh, you know, basic data to the viewer from the notebook. Um, as I, I sort of said is, you know, this data is, is really, it's all present there in, uh, in, in 3D. And so um, you know, I can scroll through now to a different slice, say at you know, the bottom of the field of view. Um, and if I you know, take my screenshot now, um, it's, uh, it, it shows the bottom. Actually, one thing I'll mention, because I'm, I'm sort of mentioning screenshots all the time. If you just want to say, take a screenshot that um, saves out the disk, you can take one here, either including the viewer or not including the viewer, um, depending on what you want, you know, if you just want the image as well. Um, and we, you know, we have a bunch of saving functionalities as well, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so, um, you know, this data, as it says here, this is really, it's a, um, it's a, a 3D volume. Um, and um, we can look at um, sort of different um, slices through that volume and in, in different um, um, orientations. And so here we can actually, um, in the viewer, use the um, roll dimensions button now to take uh, what is maybe sort of effectively like an X Z slice. And so now, um, you know, we've got 256 parts in the slider um, and you can scroll through. I can do, maybe do one more. I can see, oops, um, see that again. Um, and um, if I go one more, then I'm sort of back to where, where I started. Um, and um, so that, that can be quite nice as well. Um, as I said, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to um, display them simultaneously right now, but we, we will be working on I can also take a trans. Sorry, Nick, you are muted. No, still. Oh, okay. Am I back now? Yes. 
Thank yes. You. Sorry. What happened was I tried to take a transpose, and the Zoom uh, the Zoom dialog box popped up and uh, muted me. So uh, let's see if I try and transpose again. Now I transposed. Okay. It was good. I actually was sort of worried. I was like, Oh my gosh, was that a a bug in uh, in Napari, and I didn't didn't transpose properly, but instead I just muted myself. So apologies. Um, okay. So if we go back to the notebook now. Um, you can see, let me sort of take a little screenshot, see where we're at. I mean, the screenshot's now a little less, uh, less critical. Um, and um, okay, so um, in addition to supporting uh, 2D rendering, um, uh, Napari can also do sort of full 3D rendering. And so to enable the 3D rendering mode, let me come back in here. So it's actually this little wireframe button. Um, and I'm gonna turn off the membranes for a moment. So here you can sort of see just the nuclei in 3D. So it's, it's very nice, I can kind of, um, move around. I can also do things like, um, oops, the wrong channel, um, adjust contrast limits of um, uh, these as well. Um, and uh, I, we have different blending modes. So I can maybe come in here. Um, actually, I want that. I want uh, maybe this, uh, you, you know, di di just different parameters of blending and, and 3D rendering that, that, that people might um, be interested in. And um, let me leave the light down. so um, with that, that kind of concludes um, the first notebook. Um, and so um, now is um, you know uh, maybe a, a good time if there are any um, pressing questions on um, uh, you know visualization. We we learned how to um, visualize three D images, look at two D slices, uh, blend different color channels, um, and um, the next lesson will will focus on manual annotation. So maybe if there are any, uh, any, are there any from um, moderators? Um, okay. So let me go on to the second notebook. Um, and so if you're using Binder, you should um, uh, navigate back to the um, uh, top uh, directory and launch the, the second uh, notebook. And so this one is going to focus on um, manual annotation. And again, we saw a little bit of this. Um, in uh, the demo that I gave uh, right at the beginning of this um, uh, presentation. Um, and so again, we now we need to, I'm actually gonna close this Napari um, because it's a new notebook. And so this is actually gonna create a new, um, new Napari and we have to do a new um, GUI context. So I'm gonna run that. Um, and then I'm also gonna import um, uh, this Napari and, and create an empty viewer like before. So again, that's popped up in a new window. And um, then uh, this time, we're actually going to load our data directly into Napari using the, uh, the, one of our built-in um, uh, readers. And so here, I just have to pass the path now, and I do viewer.open. And I've said I want to use our plugin. But you know, maybe you have your own file type, um, and um, you've written your own plugin, and so you want to um, use your own uh, kind of custom plug in there. So let's see if I run this. That's fine. Those are just some info messages. Um, and um, let's see here. Okay. And so we're back. I've got in um, a nuclei uh, loaded again with um, a, a slider. And so if I take a screenshot of that, um, it looks the same as when I loaded it um, kind of directly. Um, and so what we're gonna do in this example is think about um, annotating, dividing, and non-dividing cells using the point slit. And so um, we already saw an example of um, the point slit um, earlier when I was uh, looking at the pathology um, uh, example. And um, so, to get going with this, um, I'm actually going to first add the points layers um, from the notebook. I think last time when I gave when I was doing the pathology example, I added the points layers um, uh, directly um, uh, from the viewer. But here I'm going to add them from the notebook, and um, I'm going to name them. So one's going to be one points layer is going to be for dividing cells. One is going to be for non-dividing. I'm going to set the color of um, the um, uh, dividing ones to red and the non-dividing to blue. And um, I'm also gonna have this sort of n-dimensional be true property set because uh, we're kind of thinking about these things as, as being in, in three dimensions. Um, and so 
if I run um, uh, this and now let me go to um, the viewer, you can see that I've gotten two um, new layers here. I can actually use the up and down arrows to sort of scroll between them. Um, you can see when I have this top one selected, it's got, it knows that its face color was blue. When I've got this one, it's, it knows that the face color um, was red. Um, and then I, when, I, when I select the nuclei, I've got different controls up here um, for um, uh, the image layer. And so now I'm actually, um, uh, there's, there's one more thing I, I need to do before um, I can add points, which is enter the add points mode. Um, I can do that by clicking um, on, um, in the GUI but I can also do that programmatically as well. Um, let me take a little screenshot first, just to kind of see that those layers got added. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna enter add mode and I'm gonna again, enter it programmatically. And then this is just sort of reinforcing um, the theme that you know, either you can kind of do it from the GUI or you can do it from kind of Python and, um, and the notebook. And now actually, if I look over in, um, uh, in the GUI, you can see that this add mode has been activated. OK, so now I'm going to do some clicking. So I think this is not dividing. This one's not dividing. This one, this one, this. Boom, boom, boom. Up to you what you decide to do with the ones on the edges. You um, can count them or not. Um, this one's not dividing. And then I think uh, this one is dividing. And so I just annotated them all in one plane now, but you can sort of see the little um, spheres um, in, uh, in Z. And um, if I kind of come back um, uh, to the viewer um, and uh, take a screenshot, um, you can look uh, like this. Um, I can actually look at these things completely rendered in 3D as well. So I can just kind of enter a 3D rendering mode and I can sort of see around. You can see that this one is dividing. I didn't, did not get the center of the cell. If I wanted to correct that, I, I could, but for now it's, it's okay. Um, and um, again, I can uh, come back to the notebook here and um, uh, take a screenshot. Um, so um, let's say I wanted to now get the uh, number of cells um, for each class. I could just look at um, you know, the length of the data property um, in um, each of my two layers, dividing and non-dividing. So if I kind of print that out um, right now, I can see, okay, I had, oh, I said I spelled this wrong, apologies, dividing. Uh, one uh, dividing cell and uh, anyway. um, and uh, uh, 18 um, non-dividing cells. Um, and um, if I want to get the coordinates out, I can sort of see, okay, I've labeled everything in that 30th Z plane. I could have labeled them in different Z planes. Um, and what's cool now is I can actually um, save a CSV file um, with, um, this data too. So I can um, save actually maybe now I'm going to save two CSV files, one for dividing, one for non-dividing. Um, and um, I'm going to use our, our built-in plugin writers to save them. And actually, if I go to the, the Jupyter Navigator, um, you can see I, I just about a second ago created these um, uh, CSVs of uh, dividing. And actually, I can load it up into Jupyter. So it's pretty cool. You can just see that what I just created. So these are the non-dividing ones. And um, you know, this means that if you have a, 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 a biologist collaborator that wants to load this data up into Excel, they can very easily, you know, do an annotation in Nafari and then save data in a way that they can, um, you know, get into the, uh, into a tool like Excel um, uh, very easily. Okay, so um, that is an example of how to use the points layer. Um, now I um, want to show another example of how to use the shapes layer to draw our polygons. Um, for this example, our polygons um, are always uh, constrained to be in 2D, although they can be in arbitrary um, uh, Z slices. But for the sake of this example, I'm actually going to take a maximum intensity projection of that um, uh, across the Z um, axis. And I can do this actually using the data directly um, that's in uh, the Napari viewer already. So I can just um, do a dot max along that as a zero axis. Um, and um, now I have a copy of this, uh, this um, maximum intensity projection here. Um, I can actually remove, I can select and remove all the current uh, data from the Napari viewer. And then I can just kind of add in 
this uh, maximum intensity projection. Um, and so now if I look at, um, at the viewer, you can see that I've, I've got the maximum intensity projection um, loaded in. So there's, we no longer have the slider at the bottom. This is just a single uh, 2D, um, uh, 2D plane. Um, and so if I take a screenshot, here, here, I'm now going to add um, an empty um, uh, shapes layer, um, which I can use for drawing polygons. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it like nuclei outlines. Then I'm going to give it um, a, a face color, maybe an edge color, and maybe an opacity. Um, and um, you know, before I sort of created an empty layer in the um, an empty shapes layer in the GUI directly, but here I did it in a notebook. Um, and um, so if I do oops, screenshot again, didn't like that. Um, yeah, let's see, oh, no. computer is struggling. Why did it not like my shapes layer? Um, apologies. Let's see if my viewer, okay, my viewer has is recovered. Uh, I hope that didn't um, cause too many problems for other people. I might actually, just start this again rather than um, worry. Restart panel. So apologies for uh, a little bit of a technical difficulty there. I'm gonna hop down, just created my viewer again. Um, I loaded in my data again. Um, I loaded in actually the full data um, and um, I'm gonna take that maximum potency projection again. And now I'm going to add the shapes. Okay, so here I'm back. Uh, again, apologies, not quite sure um, what well, I didn't like that, but I'm now going to um, annotate um, some cells. So you can see here that I've, uh, I'm clicking um, around uh, with the polygon tool. I can use escape to um, uh, finish drawing and um, I can uh, come around this one. Um, more. Let's say I like do this and I'm like, oh my God, this is uh, a really bad. I'll show you how I can uh, correct that in a moment. So I can come in here. We've got um, a vertex selection mode. Um, so I can um, rearrange things. Um, we also have the ability to um, add and delete vertices. So I can sort of add in uh, vertices or I can be like, nope, these are all uh, terrible. So again, things you might uh, expect from a kind of a graphics tool, but now in a sort of scientific context where it's really easy to kind of get coordinates of all of these things as well, um, I can actually just grab and, and reshape um, the entire um, um, shape as well. Um, I can actually change it so that this one has, um, you know, a different color than, um, uh, than the other one as well. Okay, so maybe I'm going to draw um, one more quickly. Um, it's got the green color too. All right, so if I um, look here, let's say I want to get um, uh, the data from the shapes layer. I can go, I can index into the name of the layer, nuclei uh, outlines, and um, I've got now. Um, uh, a uh, length three list of three arrays. Um, each array has the vertices of um, each of the shapes. So it's, you know, shape, the first shape I drew, the second shape I drew, the third shape I drew, and then these are the X, Y coordinates of each shape. Um, and uh, I can actually save those if I want um, using uh, an SVG writer plugin that we provide. Um, and now um, let's see, that should um, have, um, generate an SVG. It doesn't look like it's updated here. I think this is actually showing something that I generated a while ago, but um, you can now open that tool in your favorite uh, graphics, um, you know, uh, illustrator like um, program. And um, you should be able to see that SVG um, there as well, which I think is, uh, is pretty cool. And um, okay. So another thing, um, that is, um, I think, very uh, common to want to do with um, after you've drawn polygons is to um, extract uh, sort of masks or segmentation uh, information from them. And so um, 
to do that, we can actually um, use this two labels command to uh, convert a shape um, uh, into uh, what we refer to as a, a labels layer. Um, and so if I run this first, I can see, okay, the three labels have, have been found and, and generated, which is good because I drew three shapes. Um, and if I add this to the viewer here, um, you can see now, um, so this is sort of the vector representation of what I had before, um, which were the, the shapes that I drew, um, you know, that, that were like this. Um, whereas um, here, uh, this is now the um, pixel wise um, representation as well. And so like we saw in um, the other example, in this layer type, I can um, have a paintbrush that I, um, I can paint with. Um, we have various um, hotkeys that you can use to um, quickly sort of toggle options. Um, there is an eraser functionality. There is the ability to um, kind of preserve any of the existing labels so that you only sort of um, um, edit. Like if I was sort of um, go a little nuts here, I've sort of preserved the existing labels, uh, but I'm editing a uh, free space. Um, but I can undo that because that seems like a terrible um, drawing. But um, that could be nice. Let's say if I've edited um, this cell here, um, this cell here. And then um, uh, I want to maybe um, edit uh, this cell, but I don't want to kind of paint into this one. I can kind of, you know, use that. Um, I'm going to, um, and also you can um, paint with a, the transparent background as well to um, uh, remove something. So um, that is. Um, that is where we're um, at now with the uh, labels layer. Um, and um, that's uh, if I now want to save um, out the labels, um, I can actually also save them as a TIFF. Um, so if I run this um, uh, label saving, um, I've saved out a TIFF and um, using a built-in writer. And I can actually um, just reload that. So I think that should be, that file should have appeared here, my, my, my TIFF that I should have just, um, just made. And I can, I can reload that. And um, now I've got two copies. So this was sort of my original copy and this is the copy that I just loaded in. Um, and so it's very easy if someone did some annotation, you can sort of save that out, then you can load them back in. And um, you know, maybe something that we might wanna do with annotation like this is um, just kind of like iterate through all the labels that we have and then um, find the pixels that are inside um, that correspond to each label ID in, inside the, the data from the viewer. Uh, maybe let's uh, add up how many pixels there are so we get an area. Maybe let's um, extract um, how much signal there is in that original nuclei channel and maybe let's look at the ratio. And so a sort of simple command like this and I can kind of just get how much um, uh, say signal was in each of my nuclei. And, um, you know, the, the point here is just to sort of illustrate that you can then um, easily kind of connect these sorts of annotations um, into analysis. And so with that, we have uh, concluded the second uh, lesson. So we've seen how to use the points, shapes, and labels layer to produce uh, manual annotations in the PARI and uh, save those annotations in uh, meaningful formats. And um, so, uh, the next lesson will be around um, a little bit of interactive analysis, um, but again, maybe now is a good point to pause and see if there are any um, pressing questions. Okay, Nick. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about um, the difference between or adding an image and what the layers are. So maybe it'd be good just to kind of review Great. what the layers yeah. are and, and things like that. Yeah. Thanks. Love it. Okay, so yeah, let's um, let's step back a little bit, and um, maybe we can even use this um, uh, this example. So, um, you know, layers um, they can have different types. So they could have um, you know, and a different type of layer um, you know really corresponds to um, a different type of data. Um, and so um, I think our, our, our most basic layer is really this image layer. And you can see it's got a little image icon. Um, and um, if you have an image layer, 
that means that you know the data that you're looking at it's really kind of like an array of pixels um, and, and it's hot and um, you know things you might want to do with that array of pixels are yeah adjust its contrast limits uh, adjust its color map um, and um, you know often in a in an imaging experiment um, the image data is sort of that fundamental thing that kind of thing that comes in uh, first that you maybe get off your microscope and then um, other layer types um, uh, might often um, relate to more derived um, sort of data. So here, this layer type, which has this little shape icon, is uh, shapes. And I can have multiple examples of this. So I could like have, I can create another shapes layer here. I can create another one if I want. Uh, I can rename them. Um, I can, and, and so um, here, the data type, it's really, um, uh, sort of lists of arrays of vertices and it's sort of useful for like polygonal annotation. Um, I can, uh, you know, if I just want to draw an ellipse around every um, shape or maybe um, if I want to do a bounding box, maybe I just want to, you know, draw bounding boxes around each one. Um, then the next layer type was uh, labels. So this is, um, you know, I have paint brushes um, and, um, uh, fill buckets, and again, I can I can have multiple um, different copies, and I, I can paint. Um, we had points uh, earlier that I when I was um, <clears throat> adding in different points, and we can kind of use them all together. Um, and then um, also we support a surface um, layer type for uh, if you have meshes, um, and we support a vector field uh, or vectors uh, layer type. Let's say if you have um, a um, like polarization um, experiment or something or where you want to look at, you want to render vectors. So that's a little review of um, the layer types, but I'm glad we, uh, we did that review because it's really, um, those are a, 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 a fundamental basic uh, concept within the PARI. Um, Nick, so, uh, one yes. more question. Um, a yeah. common thing that comes up is uh, 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 performance and lazy import. Can you just make a word or two on you know, what Napari is doing versus what someone has to do and what libraries, desks are that, that you Love are it. using. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, very important here. So um, generally, I think what Napari um, itself sort of does right now is kind of uh, not get in the way. <laughs> and I know that's sort of a funny way of putting it, but, um, you know, when you, um, or, or, or it's maybe, let's say, it, it's clever about requesting exactly what it needs to request. Um, and then, um, uh, so, you know, we, we know exactly at, at each moment, you know, what one, what anyone wants to be or needs, what, what data needs to be present to uh, create the view that, um, uh, that you're seeing. And so um, we can then, you know, be very careful about just requesting that data. And then it really is sort of the thing that we're requesting the data from, in some senses, it's a little bit of their responsibility to, actually then like fetch that data in uh, in the best way possible um, so there is a slight separation of concerns between um the sort of more visualization viewer side of things um that tally mentioned apari and then uh, libraries like dask and czar which i'll, I'll introduce for a moment because i think they're important to, to understand in the ecosystem as well um so um you know czar is a very exciting um a kind of chunk based file format um that has a kind of on disk representation that's very easy to load into Python in an array-like syntax. Um, and what's nice about that is um, because it's sort of uh, chunked on disk, um, you can very easily uh, access uh, chunks independently. So you don't have to sort of, you know, if you just want to see this little piece over here, you don't have to get all of it. You can just get that chunk. Uh, Dask is a library that pairs very nicely with both Zar and Napari that handles um, sort of, um, yeah, like lazy loading and uh, distributed computation. And it is um, capable of setting up a compute graph um, that understands um, exactly what, um, uh, you know, what data you're, you're trying to request and, um, and, and then sort of making sure that um, even if you have say computations in there, that you're just grabbing um, what you need. And um, so that's a little bit of uh, an intro to those two tools. And, and I think we can maybe uh, put more links um, uh, to them um, in the questions afterwards. So 
I want to do a little bit of this uh, interactive analysis um, example. Um, and um, if we don't get through the whole uh, notebook, that's, I think, uh, just fine too. Um, but uh, I'm going to get, um, get started a little bit. So uh, I'm going to do, again, I have to do the percent GUI QT. Um, and I'm going to um, import an Apari and um, create an, uh, an empty viewer um, as before. And so uh, this time, I'm going to, now I'm going to use the TIFF file in reader again. Um, and I'm going to take this maximum projection right away because I just want to work with the 2D data for this example. And so um, here I'm going to, um, I have my shape, my data is again 256 by 256. And I'm going to add um, that, uh, that data to the viewer. I'm going to stop taking the, the, the screenshots now. Um, I'm just going to show the data in the, in the viewer. And um, so here we can see again, we've got our one image layer. And um, you know, we might want to do some, uh, some analysis on this. So I'm going to load in some filters from uh, Scikit-Image. So Scikit-Image is a, a very popular um, image processing library in Python. And uh, one of the maintainers of um, uh, Scikit-Image is also one of the founding members of um, uh, Napari, Juan Nunes Iglesias. And so we're really making sure that uh, Napari and Scikit-Image will um, uh, work together you know, right from the get-go, uh, right out of the box. And so I'm going to import some of these filters. And now I'm just going to go through and I'm going to do five calls to add image. And I'm going to add, um, I'm going to apply a different filter to uh, each of, to, uh, to this image and see what it looks like. And um, so I've done that. And now you can sort of see here, we, we've, we've got many, many layers. Um, and um, they're all sort of on top of each other. And I can turn on their visibility on and off. And um, you know, this could be a really great way if you just want to explore um, you know, what are these different filters? So let's, you know, let's look at them. Okay, so horizontal sobol, okay, that sort of looks like this. You know, vertical sobol, okay, that sort of looks like that. So, you know, clearly there's a difference in orientation between these two things, um, you know, quite interesting. It seems like it's pulling out, um, you know, a little bit of, you know, contrast around um, um, horizontal or like going across, um, uh, if, I, if, I, if I transition something in the vertical way, so a horizontal edge. Um, whereas this one is maybe looking a little bit more about um, vertical edges. Um, so, you know, that's, that, that, that's sort of um, interesting. Um, you know, this filter has clearly done something else. This is, wow, really popped out um, uh, edges here uh, very, very clearly. Um, this one, okay, looks relatively similar. It's a little, little, little blood and, and these two look very, very much the same. And so, um, you know, this could just be a fun way, you know, I could do things like adjust, um, uh, color maps. I had another one in, in there. Let me kind of come in here. I can make this um, blend as well. So I can sort of blend into the original image. Uh, really just a whole kind of host of visualization things that you might want to um, you do here. Just to really, as you know, as you explore an analysis, I think this is again really about exploration. Um, so if I go back to the notebook, all right, let me um, remove all um, those extra layers. I can just sort of go through the list and uh, remove them all. And now I just have, I'm back to, back to the beginning where I just have this one there. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, explore a little bit around some interactive segmentation. So I'm gonna import some uh, processing utilities from Scikit-Image um, and uh, some morphology things, some feature things, some measuring, segmentation. Um, and, um, I'm going to do a, a filtering of, um, of the nuclei um, and uh, to get a sort of foreground background separation and then add those to the viewer. And so if I, if I run this, I can now see, all right, I did a, a foreground background um, separation and this is now a labels layer. It's just a, a very simple label there. It's just, um, uh, you know, nothing in foreground. Um, and, uh, but we can see that, you know, there are some like little funny patches around the edges. There are some holes in here some holes. So what I can actually do is use some psych and image functions to remove some of these small holes um, and uh, remove some of the small objects. And so I can just take that data and then I'm actually just going to update the data in the foreground layer in place because, um, you know, I, I, I kind of only want to just keep around this nicely processed data. So if I run that, now you can see that those little um, edges, um, that, 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 those sort of the small objects around the edges are gone. The holes have been filled. This looks quite a nice, uh, like quite a nice mask where I've got 
uh, background and then nuclei in the foreground. Okay, but now I want to segment it so I get you know a, a, a different uh, region for each uh, nuclei. And um, the method I'm going to take here it's got a marker controlled uh, watershed. Um, and um, maybe actually I should link there are some nice uh, tutorials in scikit-image for this approach. Um, suffice uh, to say now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, try and, and end up with a marker with a point that's located in um, each of these uh, nuclei um, and then um, use that point to seed an algorithm that can then find the boundaries of the nuclei. And so to find those points, I'm actually going to do something, I'm going to take something called a distance transform. Um, and uh, I can use this, this uh, function from um, uh, SciPy ND image, uh, distance transform to, to take it. And uh, if I load that into the viewer, you can see, okay, what is the distance transform done? It's basically for everything in the foreground, it's asked how far away is that pixel from the boundary? And so you can see that the dark pixels are either outside, you know, they're in the, in, 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 in um, the background area. Um, but then as we move in towards the center here, um, it gets brighter. That's because these pixels are further away. So if you're really far away from the boundary, um, that means um, that you're very bright. And you can see here what's kind of interesting is because there's a bit of a choke point here, um, these things are a little bit closer to the boundaries than these things here. And so you already you can kind of begin to see, oh, this is a hot spot, this is a hot spot, um, you know, this is a hot spot, this is a hot spot. And that's maybe going to help us find um, the centers of these cells. And so if I actually do a little bit of smoothing in this case, um, and now you can see, okay, I've got maybe really more clear hotspots for the cells. And so um, if I go in and I try and find the peaks of uh, those, that smooth distance transform, um, and those peaks correspond to points, so I can add them as a point layer um, with uh, a red color, um, I can see that, okay, this has happened. So I've done a good job here. I found these points really well. Um, that point looks a little weird. This point looks a little weird. So what am I going to do? Okay, I can come in here. Okay, I'm going to select that one. Let me delete that one. Um, let me grab this one. I might just move over here. Um, maybe I'm going to add a point here. Maybe I'll add a point there. Maybe I'll add a point there. Maybe I'll add a point there. See what happens. And so now I've been able to use, oh, look, there's a, a spurious point up there as well. So let me, um, let me select that guy and delete that one. Um, and so now I've been able to clean up um, the, um, the points. Um, and so now I can sort of come back to, um, to my notebook. I can get those new peaks from the, um, uh, uh, the, the peaks, um, the, the layer that I named peaks. And then I can run a segmentation. And so here I'm going to run now this marker controlled um, watershed segmentation uh, using um, the you know, processed foreground data from before, the distance from before, and um, these markers that came from these, um, these points. And so if I look, how is it done? Oh, it's done a pretty good job. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of funkiness going on there. Maybe you know, something that can be edited there. But I can actually take the paintbrush now and manually correct that if I wanted. Um, and so there you can have a workflow where you did uh, you know, an automated segmentation on you know, thousands of your cells, but then you did a quick manual touch up as well. Um, so that's an example. Um, I can actually uh, also- Nick, sorry, can I stop you? It's just yeah, to clarify, yeah. uh, be because we have some question about uh, layers. Yeah. Um, to resume it is, what are layers? Layers are everything that come out from some operation we do with a Python library. So it can be a segmentation, can be a channel, can be another dimension of the data set, right? Yeah, so, that, so layers themselves, uh, you know, they correspond to these different data types. So, um, you know, there are the, uh, the points, uh, the shapes, um, the labels. Um, you know, if you have um, a, a multi-dimensional data set, say you have a five-dimensional data set or a four-dimensional data set, you know, we, we would sort of refer to that as, um, as one layer. Um, you know, it, that maybe you can think about it as it's like it's data and then the property and key properties associated with that data. So like here in this example, I've got one, two, three, 
four or five layers and they're accumulating in this list. And it's not necessarily the case that every operation has generated a layer. It's only kind of when I chose to, to sort of say, okay, let's make a layer. Um, let's make a layer here. And, and in this particular case, you can maybe think about them as like critical steps in your analysis workflow. Um, but you could have, you know, I could have not saved out the distance transform as an individual layer. It's like only because I wanted to look at it. Um, so I hope that, that helps. Okay, thank um, you. And I can save, um, uh, save out this uh, segmentation like before. Uh, again, don't worry about um, these little messages. Uh, that's all fine. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're approaching maybe like five to ten minutes left. Um, there are maybe two quick things that I wanted to um, to mention um, before wrapping up. Um, these are definitely the most advanced parts of the tutorial, and so really no worries now if um, this goes um, a, a little quick right now or um, if um, uh, something doesn't quite work, um, you might have to install Magic GUI. Um, there was maybe a little bit of a question if it was um, present in our requirements, um, depending on when you downloaded this package. So, um, but uh, what I want to show here is just a tiny little example of how you can extend the GUI, with, extend the viewer with kind of a custom GUI element. And so um, we're going to use a, a library that's um, a Magic GUI that's maintained by the Napari um, uh, team, and um, it's uh, got its own uh, documentation um, page here, uh, Magic GUI, um, and um, it can be used to kind of really minimally make simple GUIs um, for when you kind of specify um, um, sort of functions. So, you know, you don't actually have to um, write the GUI right now, which is quite nice. So I'm going to import it. If um, you are unable to import Magic GUI right now, you might run, need to um, uh, pip install uh, Magic GUI, which you can do directly from the, the notebook if you um, add an exclamation mark before the pip install, but you will need to restart your notebook um, as well. But again, no worries if you don't follow along with this bit because we're, we're almost at time now. Um, but I did want to sort of say like the concept here is that I'm going to add a, uh, I want to do an interactive thresholding where I have a slider um, of, um, that can go anywhere from zero to a hundred. And that's going to um, compute a percentile. It's going to be used to inform a percentile value um, that I'm going to uh, use to um, do this kind of thresholding at. And um, so if I run this now, I'm going to sort of decorate this, uh, my little function, my little threshold function um, with my magic GUI call. And I'm going to add this GUI element that I get out of it to the viewer, to the window actually as a dot widget. And so what does that actually look like? If I come here, you can see now that I've got this little thing down here. Actually, um, I can uh, move it around and pick it up. Um, and um, I can put it up here even. And um, I've got my own little dock widget here. And if I run the dock widget, you can see now I've got this slider. And as I move the slider, um, it changes a threshold. And um, you know, there could have been a much more complex piece of functionality. It could have been a much more complex analysis routine that took in a parameter. Um, but this is sort of nice because now I can kind of interactively do parameter space. I'm like, okay, no, this is not so good. Uh, all right, this this stuff this looks maybe this maybe looks kind of good. Um, and so Magic GUI makes this sort of extension uh, very easy. The, the last one, a bit of extension that I want to show um, as well is, is what it means to add a custom key binding. So we can also, um, again, using a, a decorator to the viewer, uh, bind a custom key. So in this case, I'm gonna bind um, shift P to do that kind of filling of holes and objects using um, the data from the uh, the threshold. So if I add this now to the viewer, uh, I come here, nothing's actually changed in the viewer. It, does, it looks the same, but if I do uh, shift P, I can do that fill. So, okay, so that didn't go so well. So maybe I lower the threshold shift P. Okay, that looks nicer. And again, I can kind of use that, that keyboard shortcut to um, enhance my interactive exploration of the data. Um, uh, the final one I'll just show is actually that that keyboard shortcut can really be quite complex. I could really just add in that whole um, segmentation routine that we just saw before as now I'm going to bind it to the shift S. And so if I'm in here, if I now do shift S, okay, it did. And now it's using the sort of the points from, from before. 
if I you know were to sort of do uh, else, I could um, shift B, shift S, do again. That's maybe less good. So maybe I come in here and do that. Okay, so that is um, uh, just sort of some some really quick examples of you know what's it like to um, uh, add um, features to the uh, to the viewer. Um, I'm going to go back to my slides and just close entirely, and then we can. Um, uh, take uh, a few questions um, overall. So um, I wanted to say, um, you know, after today's lessons, um, you know, some possible next steps for people are to explore some of our more advanced tutorials. Um, I want to go to the Napari website quickly. So um, we have a homepage, napari.org. Uh, we're in the process of um, um, actually re improving some of this stuff, but we've got some tutorials um, in here that cover some of the basic methods around the different layers. So I think there are a lot of questions about layers today. So that, 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 that's really great. And there's more information about the different layers um, here. Um, there's also some more advanced um, application tutorials, actually a really nice one that uh, Kevin um, made about um, annotating points with videos for, for Napari. If you want to do a kind of video annotation, um, maybe you, know, you want to um, do annotation uh, and then leverage a tool like Deep Lab Cut. This could be a really great tutorial for you. Um, Tally mentioned uh, some people asking about Dask. Um, here's a really great tutorial that Tally wrote about uh, using Dask to, to process and view large data sets. So this could be a really great um, uh, thing for people to look at next. Um, in general, we also have uh, our documentation page, which has a more comprehensive API reference. So if you want to sort of look at the parameters to the image layer, you can uh, you can really kind of go in there and uh, and find those. Um, there is um, also uh, some nice uh, developer resources if you're interested in contributing, codes of conduct, contributing guides, um, a little bit about our mission and values. It kind of gives a sense of um, you know where what we're doing, where we're we're going with this tool, um, and uh, a little bit about our roadmap, what we're like. Uh, working on right now. Um, you also might be interested in learning more about our plugins. So there's really, there's stuff about how to uh, create an Apari plugin. We actually provide a cookie cutter repository for people to get going. If you want to make an, an IO plugin, maybe you have that kind of custom file type. Um, and uh, a little bit more about some sort of the advanced um, uh, uh, concepts like events and uh, threading. Uh, maybe if you're interested in like an image acquisition context and you're interested in our, our multi-threading um, API. Um, so these are more kind of advanced um, uh, features. So uh, with that, I mentioned the plugin interface. I mentioned the IO plugin. Um, more info, napari.org. We're always monitoring the image SC forum um, and then the Napari tag, please reach out to us there. Um, and um, we're, um, you know, uh, on GitHub, uh, raise an issue, file a bug report, um, or on Twitter. And, uh, you know, tweet, we love to see tweet out a screenshot of uh, any cool um, examples that you're looking at. We tweet out cool uh, screenshots of your data. And so really want to say now uh, thank you um, again on behalf of um, the whole Napari team um, in particular. I also want to thank uh, the moderators, Kevin and Tally, that have, um, um, have been so helpful today. And uh, thanks again to the organizers. So I think maybe, I, I, Rocco, I, there are some um, questions now, or I think... Uh, yes, so there are some technical questions. And uh, as you remember, we will, uh, we will answer in the forum. Um, one is uh, more pushing from users is something like, is Napari the image of Python? Or where does it sit in Napari compared to other historical yeah. tools like ImageJ? Yeah, no, I, so I, I think the concept of, you know, the ImageJ for, for Python, um, that, you know, I, I think that's it's a reasonable um, uh, way to look at it. I think we, we do want to um, sort of be foundational um, in that sort of way. I think um, ImageJ has been, you know, absolutely incredible for the Java community. And um, you know, Python has sort of, of has lacked uh, a viewer um, in, um, or is it not, is, it's been a little bit more um, uh, uh, harder to get sort of in, interactive viewer and particularly the concept of plugins <clears throat> where we're really um, definitely inspired by uh, ImageJ um, there as well. And um, I think, you know, the other thing is, um, I think what, what's so great about ImageJ is it's so easy to get going with if you're a, be a beginner. And so I think um, 
you know, there's a lot that, that we aspire to that. Um, and it's actually possible to use ImageJ and Napari um, together as well. Um, you can, there are cross language bridges that um, allow you to, to get back and forth between them. And um, we're working on, uh, we talk quite a bit with, um, with that community and, and we're working on a, a little tutorial um, that actually um, uh, on the website, uh, on the tutorial's website, there's a draft tutorial um, that explains how to use ImageJ and Napari together, which I think is very exciting too. Okay, thanks a lot. I ask Kevin and Tali if they want to comment further more. Uh, there was one question that came up a lot about um, 3D, like can, can labels and shapes be in 3D? Can you annotate in 3D? So can you comment on how you extend what you showed here to 3D? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the labels can be visualized in 3D. Um, they can be, yeah, they can be looked at in 3D um, as shapes can also be looked at in, in 3D, but all our shapes right now are um, themselves 2D, if that makes sense. I uh, maybe yeah, I probably won't load up a quick, quick example, but, um, but they do have a concept of sort of uh, depth. Um, right now we don't support any um, interactivity in 3D. So like you can't like paint into the 3D view. You can't like when it's rendering in 3D, um, you can paint into the successive 2D slices and you can actually extend your brush to have a, a larger uh, volume than just the particular slice that you're painting into. Um, I think right now, because we don't support um, ortho views, um, you know, 3D painting, it is, you know, you kind of have to go slice by slice. Uh, and similarly, uh, 3D polygons, you have to go slice by slice. But if you if you do go slice by slice, it, it, it will work. Um, but I think we want to make that um, easier and um, uh, more user friendly for people. Okay, Kevin, uh, do you have any other comment you want to do? Uh, no, I think that that was good. And uh, I just okay. want to say thank you. Um, it's great. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for participating and please fill the survey and give us feedback about uh, which topic you would like to see. And I remember next webinar will be about uh, single molecule localization microscopy uh, analysis tool. So please register also for the next webinar. And I, thanks again the, I thank again the speaker and uh, Julian Colombelli that is helping a lot in background. So thank you. Bye.